So we have uh, Sarah Professor, Sarah Arter, sorry. So she's been with us uh, for a long time now. She's working, she's the head of the Oncologic um, Imaging Department, is it? <laughs> in, uh, in what? In Sheba? Yeah, in Sheba. Not anymore? Oh, okay, not anymore. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> so thank you so much, Sarah, for being with us. Let's follow her all the way and see how we are managing her with the help of uh, imaging. <coughs> First of all, it doesn't help her a lot to know that she is one of the million patients that are diagnosed annually with colorectal cancer. However, what we can tell her is that in the last two, three decades, there has been a major improvement in the treatment and prognosis of these patients by the introduction of two important things. First of all, the total mesorectal excision, that a surgical technique that uh, involves removal of the rectum, the tumor in the rectum, including the mesorectal fat with the lip nodes and the incision, the surgical incision, follows the mesorectal fascia. The other advantage was to add neo uh, adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and both these procedures yield a much uh, better prognosis and a significant lowering in the recurrence of, in the rate of the recurrence. So let's see what is our task as radiologists. What points should be addressed while evaluating the imaging that we are looking at? First of all, we have to look for the uh, mesorectal fascia as the clear resection margin, a clear mesorectal fascia. It means a mesorectal fascia free of tumor is a good prognostic sign and sometimes even can be cure for that patient. So this is one of the most important factors while evaluating the imaging of that patient. Secondly, we are able to predict response and to detect recurrences. And the most important thing is that it's our task to be the key role in the management of these patients. And why is it so? We can, in MRI is the best modality to evaluate these critical uh, prognostic factors dealing with uh, rectal cancer. So uh, what are uh, the outlines of this uh, view this afternoon? First of all, to evaluate prognostic factors by MRI. Just quickly, briefly, to see MRI techniques and to see how we use it in preoperative staging, post-chemotherapy uh, imaging, and then detect tumor recurrence. So what are these prognostic factors that are so crucial and very, very important for the surgeon to know before he deals with that particular 61-year-old lady with rectal cancer? First of all, at this stage, as we saw previously, the main, a major factor in colon, colorectal cancer is the involvement of the wall of the colon. Then, specifically in the rectum, we are dealing with the circumferential resection margin and with the mesorectal fascia. They are both complementary, one with the other. 
Then we look for Venus invasion, which is a bad prognostic factor. And as with colon cancer and as with other malignancies, we have to check the nodal status. So let's start. How to perform? Uh, it's very uh, nice to see the images of the three Tesla. We just got a new uh, three Tesla machine three quarters of a year ago, and we were fascinated by the beautiful pictures. But uh, don't be very sorry. Articles that I have seen in the literature say and state that you can do it on both, and there is no um, superiority to each of them. 1.5, either 1.5 and 3 Tesla are both almost the same. Uh, we can use anti-spasmodic agent. There are a couple of no's. Just listen, it's very easy. No rectal, uh, no endorectal coil. We've seen the endorectal coils and the prostate. The beginning of the MRI of the rectum started with the endorectal coils, and that was terrible. Because as we will see later, many of these patients are presented with bulky tumors. And you cannot introduce the rectal coil, and it's painful for the patient, and it's also and is it for the radiologist to watch it and to start fight with the big bulky mass? No bowel preparation, so it's easy. And even not rectal gel. Rectal gel is good when you have a small tumor. But if you distend the rectum, you might miss the nice uh, imaging of the mesorectal fascia and even sometimes small nodes in the, mes in the mesorectal fascia. What is the protocol? We are using, if we don't use endorectal uh, coil, we have to use at least phase array coil. And again, you see that that T2 is, continues to be our good friend, even at the end of the day. You can do only T2, free uh, the axial, coronal, and sagittal of the rectum, and you're done. You don't need even like, gadolinium. It's, you can add it, but it's not a must for the first staging of uh, rectal cancer. Uh, nowadays, we also add uh, high resolution. That's, of course, that's a must. T2 high resolution and no fat suppression. The fat suppression ruins our, di our diagnosis because, as you will see later, we are all focusing on the mesorectal fat. Then everything is going on there the uh, tumor infiltration, the lymph nodes, and if we suppress that fat, that fatty tissue, we are going to lose and miss all these uh, prognostic factors that we are looking for. So no fat suppression. And now, we, of course, we are adding the diffusion rating images and contrast enhanced dynamic or what we are doing, it's not correctly the, the contrast dynamic, we are doing a multi -phase. But it's really, as we go on a lot and see, gadolinium does help a lot. Especially after the neoadjuvant treatment. So the other most important thing to mention and to stress is that you have to angle your cuts according to the tumor um, line. If you look on the sagittal, you look for the tumor, and on the axis of the tumor, you build your axial. And it's very important to do it like this, like it comes sometimes to bleed, because otherwise you will miss and you will overstage sometimes a rectal cancer as a T3, only because you didn't angle properly your axial cut. So here is the axial cut. You can very nicely see, we are starting to see, this is the mesorectal cassia as you see all around, and we see it because it is a very uh, fine, narrow line, hypo-intense, uh, and we see it very easily in contrast to the mesorectal fat that is high intensity. On these axial uh, cuts, we build the corona, and on the corona you can very clearly see the tumor all along, you can appreciate the rectal wall. The rectal wall is a muscle and it's also hypo-intense and you have to follow and see that it's a continuous line. 
when that line is broken by the tumor, we call it uh, infiltration or a T3 tumor. Uh, if uh, corona uh, uh, sections are very important, especially in uh, low uh, rectal cancer. And here is how we uh, separate low from middle and high. Why is it important? Clinically, low, the lower uh, rectal cancer are more invasive, as they will see, they have less fat at the end of the mesorectal fat is getting thinner. So the tumor in the rectal wall can easily infiltrate the uh, uh, mesorectal fat and easily infiltrate into the levator ani and all the sphincter complex. So also the prognosis of this low rectal cancer is worse uh, in comparing to the mid or high rectal cancer. So let's uh, review for one or two seconds the complex anatomy of the anal sphincter because there it's the whole story. So here you can see this is the rectal wall cancer and here is the fat, the mesorectal fat and the uh, mesorectal fascia. And here you can see a very nice and clear fatty tissue without infiltration to the fat. On the, uh, on the uh, other, uh, that's on the woman, on that uh, right coronal section, you can see a bulky tumor infiltrating the sphincter muscle. And if we want to see more details, we can see that how we are the, the muscles here. Let's start from the beginning. This is the coronal section. This is the coronal section. So here you can see, first of all, the levato ani, then the pubo rectalis, and then the external sphincter complex. So all this is the continence mechanism. Once the tumor is large, it infiltrates the muscle, and that patient will uh, have to have a, a extended surgery and abdominal primary section. So he loses the rectum with all the sphincter mechanism. If that fat is not involved, he can undergo a low anterior section, which keeps the external sphincter muscle in place. A gadolinium can help sometimes. As we can see, this is the tumor on the lateral, on the sagittal. We see the tumor low rectum, and we measure it from the anal verge. And look how much clearer and more obvious it is after gadolinium. So let's see the anal sphincter on this axial view. We can hardly see it on the T2-weighted image. We can see the tumor. But you look how clear we see the internal sphincter is enhancing with the gadolinium, so we see it clearly. We see the external sphincter, and here is the tumor enhancing mass involving the internal. However, the external sphincter is spared, so we can have a low anterior section and remain that's a big difference for the patient. So what we are doing with the MRI, we are directing the surgeon where his surgical plane is going to be. So back to our prognostic factors. Let's start with the T-staging. The T-staging, as we heard uh, priorly also in the rectum, is T1 invades submucosa T2 muscularis propria, 3 through the wall, and 4 invading neighboring organs. So here is an example of a, a male with a colon cancer. We can see very nicely, very nicely the wall, and there is no disruption of the wall by the cancer. We can see the mesorectal fascia, and there is a lymph node. We'll come to it later. So what we stage is, is T2, or it could still be even T1. This is the one, uh, the one point that MRI is not good and we have to be helped by ultrasound. Transrectal ultrasound is excellent to differentiate T1 from T2 tumors. And also T1, T2 from T3. But he has so many limitations that we use it for very small and early tumors, but not for the larger bulky ones. First of all, it's operator dependent. Then it we don't see much limited by penetration, and it's 
more difficult even if the patient has a bulky stenotic tumor. You can't go with your probe. So let's see how is CT doing. Not really marvelous. Look, at this is the same patient. This is from his, we, we are doing the CT for uh, radiation planning. So this is his CT and this is the MRI. You don't see anything here. You don't see the mesorectal fascia that is so nicely outlined on the MRI, mesorectal fat, all the lymph nodes, and you see the tumor. The, the, it's only the tumor you can see here, but the rest is clear. So let's start and see how we are staging the patient. So these two patients are both, I, I wrote T1, T2, since we cannot differentiate them. But what's important is that, that they are not above T2. So usually they can go to more conservative uh, surgery and they don't need any neoadjuvant therapy. So this is our uh, goal and this is our role as radiologists to separate this T1, T2 from the rest T3, T4 tumors. So these are both, one is a male with the other is a female, both they have T2 tumors. There is no invasion, no penetration of the rectal wall. So moving on to the circumferential resection margin. What is the, cir uh, the circumferential resection margin and mesorectal fascia? As we said earlier, this is the preparat of the rectum taken outside by the total mesorectal excision. So this is the mesorectal fascia, this is the lumen, this is the cancer, and here is the cancer infiltrating into the fat. However, not beyond. So let's see what these two mean, the CRM and the mesorectal fascia. The CRM is a measurement. It's the shortened distance between the tumor, between the infiltrating tumor into the fat, from the tumor to the mesorectal fascia. And that CRM is a very important prognostic factor. The larger the CRM, the better the prognosis. If the CRM is less than one millimeter, we can predict that that mesorectal fascia will be involved. That means that the surgeon will not be able to perform a curable surgery, so we will not operate at this stage. The patient will get neo-chemoradiotherapy, neo will downstage it, and then he'll have the surgery, and then he might have a clear resection margin. So remember that mesorectal fascia and that CRM, and you can only see them by MRI, not by other modalities. So let's see how this influences our decision. So these are two patients, both have T3 disease. But look at what's happening with a uh, uh, five-year uh, local recurrence rate. Those who have at the beginning, this is the beginning, at presentation, a huge tumor infiltrating up to the mesorectal fascia and there is a lymph node outside. So this is also very important because in this, at the surgery, you don't take out this lymph node, you leave it behind. So if you don't know that there is a lymph node there, then the recurrency will be very quick after the surgery. So this is a no, absolutely no circumferential resection, no a CRM, it's just on the mesorectal fascia, so this is bad prognosis. And you can see from the numbers, if it's a larger margin, it's just up to 8% of recurrency. If there is no margin, it's 20%. So it's a major difference in the prognosis. Lately, in the last couple of years, uh, there was an additional adding to that classification of the T, and that is T of the T3 uh, extension beyond muscularis propria. It means, look at the, the here is the uh, classification. T3A, T3B, and T3C. And we are doing the same, but we are measuring from the other side. Here we are measuring the extension from the muscularis propria, while the CRM is to the uh, mesorectal fascia. This is just the complementary. And this also implies a good or bad prognosis. So T3A is less than 5 millimeters, like this one here. It's a very small, small extension. And T3 is more than 10 something, 10 millimeters. And 
Here we can see two examples of two patients. That patient with T3A has a higher survival rate. That's the one we showed you so earlier. And this is, look how large, there is a large uh, infiltration into the mesorectal and uh, into the mesorectal fat, and this is very prognosis. Okay, at the beginning of our uh, start, when we started with these MRIs, we did uh, some overstaging, like in this patient. We saw that rectal MRI, this is a, a man with, here we can see the tumor, and we saw these small, uh, hypodense lines into the mesorectal fascia, and we called it T3. The patient went to surgery, and it was only the scoplastic reaction, and not T3. So, two uh, T3. So, now we have learned or it is there and further on that we have to look for these small nodularities in order to call it a true T3. Okay, moving further, T4 tumors. I just want to call your attention to that peritoneal reflection. Here I marked it with that it's so thin. This is the peritoneum. And why is it important? Because above it's colon cancer. Below, it's rectal cancer. Now, the surgeon, they are always nagging me. Is the peritoneal reflection involved or not? Because they plan an extended surgery if the peritoneal line is involved. And you see, it even has got a specific classification. So, stage T4A is peritoneal involvement, and T4B is adjacent organs. So, it's already the more uh, diffuse disease. So let's see some. Here is the, where do we look for that peritoneal line? This is the seminal vesicle. So we look for, we look for, look for it on the tip of the seminal vesicles in men and in the women at the angle of the uterocervical angle. Utero so let's see some examples for T4 disease. So this is our, one of our youngest patients. We are starting to see now younger and younger adults with the colon, uh, rectal cancer, and uh, they come with very extensive disease. Look, this is a 30-year-old guy that comes in with a huge uh, rectal cancer, lymph nodes, and even what's worse is that this is uh, invasive, of invasive to the right seminal vesicles. We saw earlier on the previous lecture that the seminal vesicles are high T2. So you see that that low intermediate T2 means cancer infiltrating the seminal vesicle. And that is this. This is our 61-year-old lady that came in with the uh, rectal cancer, and this is invasive the cervix. So let's go on with that lady with the cervical invasion. That's the sagittal. You see, just a T2 sagittal tells you all. So it, it, it is, this is her vertical uterus and cervix. This is the huge. As you can see, these are all our patients that they, most of them are coming with huge bulky masses. So this is a huge tumor infiltrating, invading, invading the cervix. And here on that sagittal, we see also another risk factor. This low line is the intermediate density, and that is extramural venous invasion. It means the tumor invaded the vein. The veins, the, usually the arteries, veins, and the, and the veins are sickle void because there is blood flow. And here we can see this intermediate uh, intensity, and that means another worse prognostic factor. So, moving on to the last of these uh, staging uh, factors, and these are the lymph nodes. Here again, this is a circumferential uh, tumor, a small CRM, we can see the mesorectal fascia. These are the, endo, uh, the vascular invasion, and here is a lymph node. So, let's quickly discuss the evaluation of lymph nodes. That is a very disappointing method for us radiologists. So how do we uh, classify them? M0, no nodes, one to three, and one, and more than three, and two. So that's okay. But how do we diagnose these metastatic nodes? So we only have one thing, and that's we know to measure. We know to count them, and we know to measure them. So that is so far the only 
uh, criteria that we use. And in rectal cancer, it's more unique than other cancers. There is a high incidence of micrometastasis in very small nodes. So you see, to be on the safe side, we take nodes uh, above five, up to between five and eight centimeters, we call them positive. So what about this patient with a large rectal cancer and a few nodes? So that node is okay. If we measure it, it will be more than five. What about this small node? Here is one, and here is another. So somebody did a study and found, and I want you to look, watch it, and remember that almost half of the, of the lymph nodes with a small size, less than five millimeter, could be metastatic. Does a morphology add to the sensitivity or specificity? Not really. When if we can try and look for irregular order or mixed signal intensity, but you have to magnify it by, by 10, by 20 to see that usually they are so small, it's very difficult really to talk about all these criteria in a four or five millimeter node. And you see how far we are from the ideal for them, it's more in the 65 and 75. It's not so good. It's not good. Okay, can the dolinium help? Here is the, the, another patient that we use gadolinium. We are doing all of them with gadolinium. And we see very clearly these nodes. You see them in the internal uh, uh, iliac nodes. And if we try to look for them on the T2 that we so much love to, to look at, we can hardly see them. It's here. It's the same part. Believe me, and you, you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't spot it here. And here it's so easy. However, and here is another, another patient with a small note. Studies showed that gadolinium did not increase diagnostic yield for tumor and other staging. So again, we don't, we, we, we are not there yet. PET helps, PET is doing a little bit better, as you can see here. PET is a very small node. However, it lights up and it's easier to see. And somebody did a, a study comparing PET and uh, PET FDG with MRI and found that there is a yield of 90%. So when we get the new MRI PET, maybe it's something to look forward to exactly. Okay, now I have a question for you. This is a 47-year-old patient with colorectal cancer. He had surgery seven years earlier and he comes in with a lesion, a focal lesion in the liver. So we, we do an MRI, and what is it? This is a T2. So on the MRI T2, what is it? High, densi high intensity, low intensity on T1, zero gadolinium active. So what could it be? A cyst. Do we let him go? No. no. Why? What? He had cancer. So, we send him for a pet. He had one pet earlier, six months earlier. And I don't know if you see. Yes, you can see. On the, the, the six months earlier, today, when we did the MRI, that's more or less the same. We can see the cystic lesion. I'm saying more uh, carefully. I know what it is, so I, I don't want to cheat. So, this is the lesion. No update. And if we go back, we see that it was smaller six months earlier, and I didn't want to bother you with too many. I went earlier, and earlier it wasn't there. So what are we talking? A man, as Michal said, is previous cancer, so already we are uh, very uh, cautious, and he has a cystic lesion. So what are we doing? His oncologist, that is a very good friend of mine, we are sitting all the time in the multidisciplinary team, as I will show you, she insisted she wants to know what it is. Then we bring it back, and Dr. Ramon is doing a, a biopsy. And what does the biopsy show? Adenocarcinoma mucin producing. And that guy had a mucin producing adenocarcinoma in his past. So remember, and don't, it's a pitfall. These uh, mucin cancers. First of all, we have to mention it. You see, it's not our job to tell histology. 
But if we, we see the, the type of uh, intense lesion on our good old friend T2, and we say to the surgeon, and to the oncologist, look, that might be a, a mutsin producing tumor, that it's changed their attitude also because it is a higher metastatic tendency. And what is more important, it doesn't, uh, uh, there's no gadolinum egg, there's no FEG uptake. So don't uh, rely so much on the pet FEG in these patients. And they can cause cystic liver metastasis, as was in our patient. That patient went to surgery, there was only one lesion. He underwent a right lobectomy and is now nine months after the surgery with no evidence of disease so far. So he is being under a careful surveillance. Okay, so we are going back to our patient and see how do we report. First of all, we have to measure. So we measure from the anal verge and we look on both axial and side. Then we go to the nodes. So she will be, she has several nodes, so she will be M2. And what is worse, we see on the lower cards, we saw that it was involving, the, as if you remember, it was involving the cervix. And even worse than this, it involves the pelvic sidewall. So that patient is stage T4. So how do we report? I can't overstress it. You have to have a structural report. That you have a common language with your colleagues. Either you are a radiotherapist that knows to extend the field, or with your surgeon who has to plan the surgical cut. So it doesn't matter. There are several uh, structural reports. You can do it with five uh, rows, you can do it with seven, but it doesn't matter as long as you include all these parameters. And somebody put it so nicely. Call it the distance, so you will never forget and you have to check each of them. So what is the distance? First of all, tumor side. We have seen we separate the rectum to classify to upper, middle and lower. Then we have to tell them the distance from the anal verge, then the T stage, anal complex, nodes, mesorectal fascia and CRM, that are both one depends on the other, and the extra mural vascular invasion. So always check the distance and you have to fill in a structure report. Okay, so now we are coming, we fill the structure report, we send it to the physician, to the referring surgeon, and then we sit together, we have even a WhatsApp group, and you know, it's nice to sit together. And who is there? The oncologist. I, I think that all of them are important, although the radiologist is the most one, but I put them on the alphabetic order, so everybody could be pleased. So it's the oncologist, the pathologist, the radiologist, and the surgeon. And the task of the team is to direct how triage, how, what to do with the patient. Is it straight ahead, total misorectal excision, and then we are done, and the patient is free of disease? Does it need new adjuvant, and then total misorectal? And that is very important to determine a tailor preoperative for every individual patient. So, let's go move to the last thing. What, the, the next thing is post, do I have still time? Who is stupid? A post a CRT assessment. As you see, many of them are coming with an advanced disease and most of them, so we have work to do. First we do it before, and then we assess them later. We are book, fully booked up. So this is the uh, patient with the rectal cancer, and it was a T3, because we see these small little nodules budging into the um, um, perirectal fat. And here we, we downsize the, the, the tumor. Look at that mess here. We can hardly notice it. And that allows the sphincter uh, preservation surgery. Another example, this is a lady with a tumor here, invade, invading the lower uterine segment cervix, and this is after a CRT. Look, all of a sudden you can see there is a distance between the two, so then she can go to surgery. And uh, even this is lately coming into practice, there is a tumor regression MRI graded even. 
So this is also a new edition since uh, the, it was published in uh, 2008. And what is that? Five categories, complete, that's great one. We don't see any evidence of tumor, good. We see some fibrosis and no obvious of real tumor, as you can see here. So this is just a place to stress that if we were questioning, we need gadolinium, we don't need gadolinium, in the, at presentation, there is no doubt about it. In all the uh, studies, they agree, in our experience as well, that you have to have gadolinium if, but, while assessing post uh, radiotherapy treatment. And that uh, gadolinium uh, helps us a lot to give, again, the surgeon a new map that he can plan his surgery. So this is a 70-year-old man that had a, a, a circular large a mass, and this is after treatment, and we, we saw that his partial response, he went to surgery, and uh, there was no residual tumor, tumor and, and no uh, pathological implant. This is our lady coming back to our lady, that uh, 61 year old woman, she got radio uh, chemotherapy, and look how nicely she responded. This is the previous, again, this gadolinium. This is the previous uh, study before treatment, and this is the study after treatment. She went to surgery. She had APR because the tumor was very low. She had transabdominal hysterectomy, bilateral cervical hysterectomy. It was nothing in these in gynecological organs. They were all clear. And what, she had tumor, as we could see here, invading the pericolic fat. But what's very important is, remember, the resection margin was free. So she had a good chance of cure, or at least of a long time survival. All the 11 nodes, it's not many because sometimes you take a lot more, all her 11 nodes were just reactive nodes, no tumor found. Now she's three months after surgery and no following her. So just to complete that uh, tumor regression grading by MRI, slight is little areas of fibrosis, but mostly tumor, and the worst is grade five, that there is no change between before and after. And that's what we saw here. This was also one of our early cases, early patients. Here is a large mess, and this is after therapy, and we thought that there is no, no much response because there is still a large mess. However, it, it, he went to surgery, and at surgery, most of that mess was fibrosis and only a few cluster of residual cancer. Here comes the place, maybe, to help us with the fusion weighted images. I'm not going into, again, into the tool because we had a, you had a lot yesterday and today. I just mentioned that this diffusion weighted imaging is now being used to assess response and to predict even early response. And how does it work? This is the cancer, diffusion weighted imaging of the cancer. And this is the ADC, so you see that's high. Diffusion weighted imaging and low ADC. Low ADC means restricted movement. So it means a lot of cells, it means cancer. When we give therapy, we kill the cells, so we, there is less restriction and uh, the ADC is right, is right. So this is just an example of a patient with a low rectal tumor. We see the rectal tumor we saw it earlier and see how the diffusion makes it much easier to spot. It's not a very nice uh, imaging, it's blurred a little bit, but you can really see the, the tumor and see the low ADC value. So now we give treatment and that low ADC value, first of all the mass gets smaller and if you can see, you know, we have to be very, very um, focus to see that that low ADC is a little bit higher, so it means response. Okay, finally, we are following up the patients and we are looking for recurrence. So this is a 62-year-old man with rectal cancer, okay, we saw him earlier. And looking at his bony structure, we saw some abnormal signal, you see here, and it looks like cancer, so is it metastatic? 
from the rectal cancer, very unusual. It's not continuous. It's not a invasion to form the rectal cancer. So if you look more carefully, what does he have in addition? Anybody? So, so we have to look. Don't forget that there are other organs there that could be malignant. He has got a bulky mass in his prostate, infiltrating the capsule and even up to the miserental cell. So he had both. So first of all, he had to have his rectal cancer removed because he was nearly obstructed, and then to take care of his prostate cancer. He didn't know anything about his prostate. So here is our guy, the 30-year-old, remember, that had the T4 tumor infiltrating to the seminal vesicle, and he got the chemo radiotherapy, and he comes back, and this is his MRI, our T2. What is wrong here? What, what, what? Nahon. The left side is sacral. What is there? A low intensity, all that bone. So what does it have? Metastasis? Yes, no, what other possibilities? What? No, no, you didn't have it before. It's new. Fracture. Good, you see? Here, here it is. Here. But if you want to see it better, our good gadolinium. This is the gadolinium, and here is the fracture, and here is the enhancement around. So don't forget, not everything is so bad, even if it's very bad, it's bad enough to be a 30 year old with rectal cancer, but this was just a, 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 a insufficiency fracture, and if you look at the literature, you find it, it parallel to the sacred side, it has some key findings that you can uh, diagnose and what is very important is not to call it cancer. So, recurrent disease, look what's happening, we, we already mentioned and again and again I want to stress it, gadolinium is mandatory here. Contrast enhanced, the most accurate, you see, it's a, and it helps us to, say, to differentiate recurrent disease from fibrosis because recurrent disease will show you and uh, early and massive enhancement, while uh, post-treatment fibrosis uh, will be less enhanced and not so early. So this is a lady that had an abdominal perinary section two years earlier, and she comes back with terrible pelvic pain, and look how a, a huge recurrent tumor. And this, you remember we talked about the mucine producing tumors. She had a huge mucine producing tumor at the past, and now again, she's got a new recurrence, and that was from our last meeting. We don't know what to do with her. She has to have either pelvic exaggeration, she has to have an extensive surgery, she's suffering. And this is the last patient that I want to present. A patient comes back, he has a low arterial resection, as you see. And he comes back with the hydronephrosis, and we see the mess. Most of the recurrent messes are in the surgical site or in the pelvis. So that's okay, we can understand. Is that mess causing that hydronephrosis? Most probably. But what bothered us was that we didn't see the ureter coming up to that point. So we looked more carefully. And here is just his pet. He has a pet CT also because pet is very useful in the follow-up and detection of recurrent disease. And on the pet we see, we saw it also on the MRI, he had a mess in his lower abdominal wall, a metastatic mess, and he had a hydronephrosis. The hydronephrosis is, that's from the pet. I took just the CT to show you. We don't do CT, pet, and MRI. We do the pet and MRI locally, especially for the surgeon. So this is from the PET CT and the hydronephrosis, new, a new hydronephrosis. So if you look carefully to see what's causing that causing that hydronephrosis is, here you can see, if you can see, I don't know how much, you can see that there is a black hole here, a black ring. This is the dilated ureter, and it's a T1 fat suppression post gadolinium sequence, and the water is black. And if you go three, four millimeters down, you see that enhancing, can you see it? Enhancing small focus of tumor. And why? We couldn't see it on the pet. Here is the pet. 
with the dilated ureter, and it ends here. But the dilated ureter must obscure the enhancement of the tumor, as both are enhanced by the FDG, the, the uric and the tumor. So we could see it from here. So one can see that it helps us if we see both studies to really see where the metastases are. Although it, it, the, it has been said that the, the prognosis of uh, patients with uh, hydronephrosis after uh, colon cancer, after rectal cancer is bad, although that is said, the surgeon went into and operated this patient because he wanted to relieve him from all these small uh, deposits of cancer. Now what is more important, and that's what is the end of this uh, review is that even on the post, we can understand why the surgeons like so much the MRI before, because they know where to go in and how to navigate. But even, and that was nice to find, that even the, the surgeons relay on MRI for resection, even of recurrent tumor, not only at presentation. So that really we have a heavy task on our shoulders. So to summarize, MRI is a major role in rectal cancer. I hope it shows it very well now here. It's the preferred modality to assess local involvement because it shows very clearly uh, the major prognostic factor that is the CRM. It's still suboptimal to differentiate T2 from T3. It's problematic with the nodal metastasis and it sometimes can be difficult to differentiate uh, post-treatment changes from residual tumor. What is the future, what are the future directions? MR lymphography with specific contrast agents to see micrometastasis. We, we can learn a lot if we develop more and more the diffusion-perfusion MRI techniques. And maybe, as we mentioned earlier, the answer will come from the PET MRI, that's the, the new Rolls Royce or Cadillac of the radiology. So that's our team. As, as you can see it, uh, rectal cancer is a multi, uh, multiple aspect uh, disease or whatever. It's, it is handled by the multidisciplinary team. We use multimodality imaging with multi-planar MRIs and multi-parametrics MRIs. 